Welcome to Studies on Prayer, Lesson 2. We're going to look this week at a passage out of Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah in scripture uh, prays a prayer with a single purpose in mind. There are times in our lives when we have something to accomplish or we need help to accomplish a specific purpose. Nehemiah's prayer, Nehemiah's life, that we look at from chapter one and some of chapter two is such a good example to us about how to go to God when we know we're called to accomplish something for his good purpose. To give you some background on this passage, we have to go back almost 10 years. Assyria came in, attacked, conquered, and enslaved the Northern tribes of Israel. And the process was lengthy and ended when they took Samaria. That would have been the capital of the northern tribes. They were assimilated into other cultures. And after this period of attack and being enslaved, these 10 northern tribes, these 10 sons of Jacob, their extended family, never did have a home again. We call them the lost tribes of Israel. Many from the south, which we would call the tribes of Judah, would be taken captive as well. But unlike the tribes from the north, many of them would return from captivity after about 70 years. By this time, Babylon had come in and taken captive or conquered Assyria. And so now these slaves, these children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the original group were now serving Babylon. There was a man who was part of this group, probably a son or a grandson of the original captives. His name was Nehemiah, and he was a very influential Jewish man who held a very important job in the palace of the king. He had heard or gained knowledge of the struggles of the people who had been left behind in Samaria and those who had left the area of Babylon or been released and gone back to Jerusalem. Ezra was in that first group that went back and he heard a report back and knew that there was great struggle in the land and he wanted to help. The prayer recorded in Nehemiah chapter one is his process of knowing God's call in his life and learning how to pray and how to help those tribes back there in Jerusalem. So the passage in Nehemiah begins. It says, now it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the citadel. Nehemiah is in one of the leading fortress cities of Babylon and a man named Hanani, one of his Jewish brothers, it says, came with certain men from Judah. And Nehemiah asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And their response to Nehemiah in verse three, they said to him, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Nehemiah says in verse four, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. It's almost impossible for us to understand what this news would have meant to Nehemiah and to the other Israelites that remained in captivity in Babylon. Babylon. 
This first group had been released to go back to the land of Israel. But when they arrived, they saw who would eventually be known as the Samaritans, the people who had not been taken captive, the people who had either fled or who had somehow escaped. Just to help you remember, they came in and took young men, men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They came in and took captive the cream of the crop. They took captive the young and the strong and the smart, and they left behind those who were infirm or older or less than they wanted to take. That became known as the land of Samaria. That group of people that stayed behind had intermarried with fellow nations. They had become a weaker people and the faith of that area had dampened. Meanwhile, in Babylon, those that had been taken captive and had maintained their faith in God, had maintained their hope of returning back to the promised land, were now going to hear that the promised land was basically in ruins. Nehemiah's hope of returning to Israel was dashed. The walls were burnt down in Jerusalem, which meant was there, they could question, was there even a temple? It had been desecrated by this time. Remember, the temple had housed the Ark of the Covenant, the holy seat of God on planet Earth. What had happened to that? Do you know, we never know after this time. No one ever knew what happened to the Ark of the Covenant after the Assyrian occupation. And so we see Nehemiah receive the news and he weeps, he mourns over what's happened, not only to his nation, to the promised land, but to the hopes and dreams of these Israelites that have been held captive. But these words so describe Nehemiah's relationship to God. He begins to pray and fast and seek God and his wisdom. His concern is genuine, but also his ability to know what to do with his concern is evident. Nehemiah said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. That's a great way to begin every prayer is to remember who we're praying to. When we have something we need to accomplish, when we need God's wisdom for a purpose or a goal that we have or a calling we hope to fulfill, we can begin our prayers, Lord, I know who you are. And with you, all things are possible. You are an awesome God and you keep your promises. Your words that we read in scripture speak of your steadfast love to those who love you and those who walk in your ways. When you pray, if you love God, if you know your life is walking in his ways, you can pray with the level of confidence that Nehemiah prayed with. And yet Nehemiah also prayed with an enormous level of humility. He says to God, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. Nehemiah is praying for these that are captive. How does he tell them that they don't have the promised land that they had grown up hearing about? to go home to. And then he confesses the sins that he 
knows are prominent among the people of Israel, the reason they were taken captive. He said he's confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. And he says to God, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, which are the laws and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. You can go back to uh, Leviticus and the Ten Commandments and all of the rules that Moses instructed the rabbis to understand and teach. And so Nehemiah begins confessing to God that he knows they needed to repent, that very much the words of Romans chapter 3, verse 23, when Paul wrote, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He confesses that they are not perfect. They are not deserving of God's blessings yet. I love the next words. He said, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there, I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Nehemiah has thought, he studied, he has remembered God's word. And so when he comes to God, it's not asking for a promise for himself. He's trusting the promise God has already made. God had said, when you are scattered because of your sin, I'll bring you back to the land. When you return to me, I will return you back to this land. And so Nehemiah comes to God, not feeling deserving of God's worth, but claiming the promise that God has given him. I think sometimes one of the most powerful things we can do for our own prayer lives is to remember we don't have to go to God as perfect people. We never will be this side of heaven. But we can go back to God. We can go to him in prayer, trusting his promises, trusting that what he said is truth. And so Nehemiah tells God, these are your servants, your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Who is that? We know in the next statement, because Nehemiah says, now I was cupbearer to the king. A cupbearer to the king was a man who was close and closely trusted by the king. This is the man who tasted everything before it was given to the king to ensure that no one could poison the king. It protected him from his enemies. But now he wants to pray for the mercy of God because he is going to go to this man, this king, and ask him something. It says in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, this was the Babylonian king to whom uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer. He said, when the wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. 
the king noticed that Nehemiah was downcast, depressed even. And this has never been the countenance that he had before the king in the past. Nehemiah was a slave of the king. And yet when he was in the king's presence, he was there with an attitude of quiet joy, maybe, with confidence, with pleasantness. Even though he was a servant, he knew what it was to be strong. And so the king immediately notices on this day that something is wrong. And he asks Nehemiah, why are you sad? Why do you look like this? And then it says, Nehemiah writes, I was very much afraid. Why would he have been afraid? Because what he is about to ask of the king could cost him his high position of cupbearer. Quite frankly, it could cost him his life. But he says to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? He tells the king, I am sad because my homeland, Israel, has been destroyed. The walls destroyed by fire. And so he tells the king, I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, I'm saying this to you now because I have prayed to the God of heaven. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my fathers, that I may rebuild it. He has just asked to be released from his position, his trusted position of tasting everything that goes in the king's mouth so that he can go back to Israel and rebuild it. Nehemiah had lived faithfully and he'd lived with kindness and respect for his captors. Otherwise, he would not have been a cupbearer. But he is now teaching us how to live in such a way that when we have to ask, hopefully we will have found favor in the eyes of those we need to ask. It says the king said to him and the queen sitting beside, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. Nehemiah was going to be able to take other people and go back to Israel and rebuild the walls. But he doesn't have those people or the ability to do that yet. So he has another ask. He says, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city, for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. But the king had given him officers in the army and also horsemen. So their arrival in this next place actually caused a bit of a commotion. And it displeased some of them that were there and thinking they had come to rebuild Israel that would then become their enemy. Honestly, you never do something for the Lord 
where you don't create a few enemies in the process. And that's what happened with Nehemiah because he was granted all of this from the king because he was allowed to pick up different properties and timber and money. He actually became a bit of a threat to the people along the way. But Nehemiah in scripture is a picture of a life well lived and the power of a life that is lived seeking God's favor. One of my very favorite quotes from prayer talks about where that power comes from. Why do we pray when we know we have a huge task? Because we can't do a huge task without God's favor and very likely without also finding the favor of others. And so Oswald Chambers writes one of my favorite quotes on prayer. It says, prayer does not equip us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. We should always be careful to dedicate ourselves to prayer, to spend time like Nehemiah did fasting and praying, laying his grief before God so that he could then have the power to do what he needed to do to serve God. Maybe you feel like you have a great work to accomplish in your life. The greatest work you can do before you begin that one is the work of prayer and prayer is work. It's praying and seeking and reading and studying and talking with God until you are certain of how you are to walk with him and accomplish this thing that he wants you to do in your life. Nehemiah is our best example in scripture for that. Do you need to take some time today to spend with the Lord and seek his face, seek his favor before you go and try to seek the favor of anyone else. Then you're in Nehemiah's place in scripture. I pray that you'll do that and that you'll find favor with God before you find favor with man. See you next time. <laughs>